I used to be tormented by an almost schizophrenic conflict between one me that thought about the future, how things would be one day, what it would be like for kids who grow up with access to knowledge and technology and are fluent in the use of all this from, from the beginning. They're not going to sit still for anything like what we try to teach them in schools today. But we're going to have to work very hard to make the stuff that they're going to learn. It's not going to come about just by, by teaching the old stuff in a more, quote, constructivist way. We have to work very hard. So I've spent a lot of time doing that. But then when I talk to teachers and practical educators about this, they often find it inspiring, but then they come down to earth and they say, but what will I do Monday? Which is teacher's jargon for be real. You know, I, I've got 30 kids there. They didn't have computers, or some of them did and some didn't, and I'm restrained in all sorts of ways. So then I'd give up the dreaming, and for a while I'd concentrate on making activities for kids teachers to do they could use now. But then I'd realize you know, this is not, this is like being in a boat without a rudder. It's no good just trying to improve the system, making incremental improvements. So I'd switch back into the other one. It took me a long time to realize that's not the way to think. The way to think is what can I do Monday that will prepare for one day? And this leads to a different kind of criterion for what you will choose. The computer, somebody whose interest is in graphic arts can use mathematics as an instrument to produce shapes and forms and motions on a computer screen. Somebody who's interested in music can make digital musical instruments. And so right along the line, we have infinitely greater ways of connecting the particular interests that an individual human being might have, and a kid particularly, with the powerful ideas. And so they really can learn knowledge by using it. And that's radically different from school, where you learn knowledge which you are not going to use. Maybe never, or maybe even if you're going to use it in 12 years' time, even granting that what they learn is going to be useful one day, that's not a good way to learn. The good way to learn is to use it now. I was a very traditional teacher. I stood up in the front of my room at my lectern. I had my prepared notes. I knew what I wanted them to have, and I gave it to them. The internet just broke down the walls of my classroom. We could go anywhere. We could look up anything. There was no longer a that's a good question. I'll come back with the answer tomorrow. Well, why tomorrow? We'll get the answer right now. Our generation, the millennials. As education has moved forward, a new generation of students has been born. The students have become advanced with technology and use it on a regular basis. Teaching facilities have quickly become outdated and are not equipped for the new breed of students. Today's students of almost any age are far ahead of their teachers in computer literacy and far ahead of their textbooks in current knowledge. Teens spend more time online using the internet than watching television. Their use of the internet has stimulated their interest in learning in general, and in particular, a revival of interest and innovation using technology. Students are not just using technology differently today, but are approaching their life and their daily activities differently because of the technology. As students get older, their use of technology becomes more sophisticated, but, comparatively, the younger students are on a fast track to becoming greater technology users and advocates. Children two to five years old have quickly become the largest group of new internet users. 
With dramatic changes taking place in the educational landscape, the way we learn and the way we teach will have to evolve to fit the needs of our students, the millennials. I too want to congratulate and thank Secretary Page for his leadership and work on the plan. And Susan Patrick, Tim Magner, I want to thank both of you for your hard work and, and leadership. And I had an opportunity to take part on the development of the plan. And I really believe it's important for our schools and for our country in that it presents a blueprint and a challenge for all school districts to rise to the occasion and to be serious about integrating technology into every child's life every day. You know, if you go to the workplace, if you go to the play space, if you go to recreation, if you go to almost any venue in, our, in commerce in our country today, you see robust technology. But one of the few places that you can go where there's an institutional activity and see still a lack of the level of technology that we need are the classrooms in many schools. And it is so important that we move forward. I'm excited about work at the University of North Alabama and working with a variety of area superintendents and school systems and principals and teachers with the faculty on trying to integrate in our teacher training programs the, account of, the importance of accountability, the importance of using formative assessment and integrating technology. Myrtle, you're right. For far too long, we have had a disconnect between training programs and the actual reality of classrooms and we need to build those bridges and I believe that that work there's examples of that work at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond Virginia there's a partnership with Henrico County and Hanover County and other school systems building programs together I, I was most fortunate to be a part of a team in Henrico County where the school board the community the staff worked together to deploy technology to students and we saw some remarkable things we had some tremendous challenges some lessons learned, but one of the most important things that we saw was a new energy in the classroom from discovery learning, from students believing every day that there was the availability to learn something that maybe had not been learned before, or to energize and excite the classroom with an activity of discovery. And I really believe that this plan lays a foundation and a blueprint to follow to look at ways and means to find the resources, ways and means to build community support, and to integrate those processes so that ultimately we improve academic achievement and student learning. One of the really exciting things that's going on today in classrooms all over the country has to do with the integration of formative assessment into the instructional process. For years, we have had excellence in our classrooms in this country on the art of teaching. Now, with the advent of technology, we're integrating the art of teaching and the science of teaching. And the result is a new level of achievement and productivity and energy. And if we'll continue to move forward with that, we can have an impact and see the results in classrooms with learning, with an enthusiasm, with students that are engaged in the learning process, something that is so important. You know, examples all over the country where superintendents and school boards are taking a leadership role in moving toward ubiquitous computing, one-to-one -one models all over the country. Henrico County, our school board chairman, Stuart Myers, or my past school board chairman is here today, who helped lead that and, and set the stage for one-to-one -one ubiquitous computing. Uh, Westside School District in Omaha, Nebraska, Putnam County, Tennessee, Greene County, North Carolina, Jefferson County, Kentucky, are places where superintendents and school boards and school leaders are deploying one-to-one -one initiatives to provide students access every single day. One of the things that we saw in Henrico County was the, a melting of the walls, students expanding learning time and increasing their enthusiasm and their energy for the process. I really believe that today we can take this plan working together and working collectively and can move forward to advance learning and to improve the quality of the classroom for students by using a variety of strategies to build synergy to provide students with the tools that they need and the, and the tools that they deserve. It is time for our country, our communities, to step up and to guarantee that our children have the same access and availability that we do in every other walk of life. 
and it absolutely can be done. It's, it's just essential that we take this step and move forward. And I think it's an exciting time for us as well. I also believe that as we fashion teacher training programs, integrating the use of technology, and also leadership programs to guarantee that we will have the type of teachers and the type of leaders that will work like Myrtle did to find the ways and the means to make a difference, to find a way to provide students with the tools that they need so that we can all be successful. A couple years ago, I was visiting a classroom at Bird Middle School. I walked in, and the teacher, they were working on a science lesson, and a young man said, you can call school off tonight at 6 o'clock on the dot. That's when the snow will start. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, we are tracking this weather system. He said, come here just a second. He said, now take a look. We've been tracking this all day. We've been analyzing the precipitation. We've been analyzing the speed of the storm, and it's going to hit between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. You can get it on the 6 o'clock news. That way we can sleep late, stay up late. We don't have to worry about it. He said, now you can count on it. Another example, another example of the engagement, the excitement, and the fun of using technology. The future is now. Our children can't wait. Thank you. I have a student named Connie Consuelo Molina. She did a project for my economics class. And she had to take a look at the effects of the world economy. And she really internalized this information. This was a, a, a period of, our, of my curriculum that she wanted to uncover rather than just cover. And she wanted to talk about some of the consequences of, world, of, of the world economy and the world market and the protests that were happening in Washington and Seattle around the World Trade Organization. So she decided to focus on sweatshops. And she wanted just to alert the people in her class on um, what she found while doing this report on sweatshops. She knew that if she had done this project traditionally in front of a class, the information would have died there in the class. She knew that if she had written it on a piece of paper and given it to the teacher, the teacher, because of the large number of students, she probably would just look down the sheet looking for mistakes, not reading what Connie felt. But Connie decided to do a documentary on, on this process. And she talked about the facts that she found. And she shared it with the class. And what I liked about it is at the end she says, look, this is what I found. You decide what you want to do with this information. Just remember that the workers are moms and sisters, like, and then she says, like you and me. And she took this documentary and posted it on the web. And several people have found it from, uh, I remember the Women's Human Rights Conference in Paris saw it and asked her permission to show it. Uh, Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple, um, asked to show, if he can show the project to about 10,000 educators, to turn around and to tell Connie that her passion and her interest to talk about something that really bothered her and to have it reach every corner of the world was an experience that she will never, it will be something that she'll never forget. 